Okay, let's go ahead and get started here. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Why You Should Upgrade to Oracle Database 12C, R2, and 18C. To begin, I'd like to quickly introduce Viscosity and our speaker today. Uh, so Viscosity, we're a solution-based consulting company. We specialize in data management-based technologies. Uh, we are an Oracle Platinum Partner, as well as a Quest Platinum Partner. We now have five Oracle ACE directors as part of our management team. And we've written over 23 books in the Oracle space ranging from performance tuning to Oracle Cloud. We have various offerings all the way from software, application development in the cloud, professional services and license management, as well as uh, zero downtime migration. Viscosity specializes in the niche technologies such as cloud, clustering technologies, data warehousing, high availability, managed services and performance tuning. You can see a few of those on this screen. And here are the three pillars or areas that we focus on, starting with data from database to data integration and analytics. The next one is uh, applications. We do run the full stack ranging from EBS, JD Edwards, PeopleSoft, as well as SaaS, PaaS integration. And finally, our focus in infrastructure everything from public cloud, private cloud, to engineered systems. And the bottom uh, shows you some of our key service offerings that were shown on the last slide as well. Uh, before we get too deep into it, during the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to email us at hello at viscosityna.com, or you can use the chat feature on your screen and we'll get back to you. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Jim Sprinsky. Jim just joined the Viscosity team as a senior enterprise data architect, and we're very excited to have him. Uh, he's an Oracle Ace director. He has almost four decades of experience in IT, serving different roles at several Fortune 1000 companies. He does hold the Oracle Certified Professional Certification for Oracle Database releases 9i, all the way to 12C and 18C as well. And uh, he's also an Oracle Master Certified Consultant. And uh, Jim has co-authored co-authored three books on Amazon. Um, you can look for them on there. And he has his blog, Generally It Depends, and it contains his thoughts on all things Oracle. He is also a regular speaker at Open World, Collaborate, K-Scope, and um, all around the US. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jim to talk through the ROI that your company can recognize by upgrading and utilizing SharePlex. Thank you. And then, Jim, I'll go ahead and unshare my screen so you can go ahead. All right. And I will start sharing. I'll use the basic mode. How's that? Kelly, can you just confirm that you can see? Perfect. Good. Good. Well, good uh, morning, good afternoon, depending on your time zone, everyone. Um, and if you're in Japan or India, uh, good, good day next day already to you. Uh, and it might be a little early in the morning for you, but uh, for us, it's uh, midday. Um, as Kelly did uh, in her wonderful introduction, uh, gave everybody kind of an idea of who I am. Let's make sure I'm paging through here. Uh, I've been around the block quite a bit. Uh, I consider myself to be a DBA's DBA. Uh, we mentioned our different uh, uh, books that I've published and so forth and so on. But the main thing here from today's perspective I'd like you to get, at least from my perspective, is that DBAs are still on the front lines of everything that we do. Uh, whether that role changes dramatically because of things like autonomous database and so forth, who knows as the world goes on. But the key thing is that we're still pretty much, from an Oracle perspective, at the center of that universe. And as part of that, we're responsible for keeping our infrastructure up and running and keeping it as healthy as possible. One of the reasons uh, that I joined Viscosity is, I'll just be uh, completely honest, these folks get it. They understand Oracle, they understand technology inside and out, and most importantly, they really understand how important the people of the organizations are to getting things taken care of. So if I'm speaking to you as a DBA, 
you know how crucial that job is. If you're a uh, DevOps DBA or an applications developer or even someone uh, at the C-level or uh, DBA manager, everyone knows how crucial the DBA is to helping make these decisions. But again, that role's changing dramatically. And as time goes on, one of the things that we need to be concerned about is the robustness of our database environment. So this is a really extremely high level discussion uh, point that I wanted to kick off, which is whether or not it's time to upgrade. And hanging around with DBAs for a long time, these are the kinds of things I typically say or hear them say, uh, have we upgraded yet? Well, we've been meaning to, but we just haven't had time and our managers, our CIO, uh, our contract said it's time. Uh, we realize support for 11204 is running out pretty soon. And I have a few more slides on that coming up, by the way. Um, our computing environments need better resource control. Uh, we have occasionally an application running out of database and it just seizes complete and utter control of uh, all of the resources on a system. And we need finer grained control of that. Um, our applications are really crying out, especially if you're working in Application Express, Apex, for res for features that are only found in later releases. Um, hey, we've got to stay on track. Our uh, competitors are able to do things because they're on a certain release of Oracle that we can't do. And if you want to insert a Beavis and Butthead laugh in here, uh, new stuff is cool. Yeah, new stuff is cool, right? There's a lot of really neat things. Uh, I'm actually involved with the 19.2, 19.3 beta testing. Um, through uh, my uh, Oracle ACE director uh, chops, if you will. And there is an enormous amount of really cool stuff coming down the pike. Uh, again, most people are a little bit more conservative being having been burned by things before, but truthfully, yeah, new stuff is cool. But all of these are very compelling reasons to upgrade, if you will, or at least migrate into a more robust, more advanced environment. And here's the thing that a lot of people don't realize, Believe it or not, 11G release two is almost 10 years old. And it's still hanging around. Uh, when I was actually in uh, IOUG, AIOUG, I should say, in India about uh, a year and a half ago, there are still people out there that are still running on 10G. But you know what? Even 11G R2 is essentially ancient. And you can see that 12CR1, which came out in June 2013, that's six years old almost already. So again, if you haven't moved to at least 12C at this point, you're six years to 10 years behind the curve. Uh, also, 18C, and we should be really clear about this, 18C and 19C are really extensions of 12C release two. 18C is really 12202. 19C is 12203. Everything's going to change with 20C. That's going to be a completely new release. So it would behoove you to get over to either 12CR2, whether it's 12201, 02, or 03, otherwise known as 12CR2, 18C, and 19C, as soon as possible. So when a lot of people consider upgrading, and by the way, I have a lot of friends, uh, fellow DBAs, especially here in Chicagoland area, that are on e-business suite. They're being told, wait for 19C. Other people are looking at this and going, well, you know, it's still sort of new. Why would I move there? And 19C right now is only available, many of the features I should say, are only available on Exadata at this point. Well, what if I'm running on an ODA? You know, what's the dilemma? Where would you like me to start? Literally the chicken, or the, the chick here in this case is wearing a virtual reality device trying to for, you know, look forward into the future. And again, if you haven't at least moved from 11.204 to 12.1, here's a big concern. Um, and by the way, you'll notice this Moz note right here, 742.060.1. That's, uh, I like to joke about that, that's uh, Larry Ellison's phone number without the area code. Uh, <laughs> extended support is something to really think about, right? Yes, I can stay in 11204 to December 31st of 2020, uh, but then I love this line, at the usual extra cost. Let's talk about that extra cost. Uh, so yes, premier support for 12.1 is going to run 
till July 31st, 2018. Could that change? Possibly. Possibly. It's changed for 11GR2 in the past. But the extended support fees for 11GR2 will run only here so far, December 31st of 2018. I believe that may have moved slightly in the last few months. But notice that for the seventh and eight years in the life of the product, the additional fee will be calculated as 20% of your current annual support fee. So if you haven't moved yet, for whatever reason, from 11204 over to at least 121, you're talking some serious simoleons if you haven't made that migration yet. Um, again, note my fortune teller lady right up there, 742-060.1. If you have any questions about anything, you know, again, if you're listening to this later, uh, some of the support di uh, uh, timings may have changed, but that's the place to go. Another thing to be aware of with 18C, we don't have bundle patches anymore, and we don't have PSUs. We now have RUs and RURs, or RUs and RURs. Um, this is something that's changed with 18C, and it really comes down to the numbering scheme, the change in the numbering scheme. For example, the first release of 18C was 18.1.0, and then the first Revi release update revision would have been 18.1.1. These are going to be coming out on a quarterly basis, January, April, July, and October. And each year as we advance into the next year, now we're in 2019, right? So right now we're on 19.1. Coming in April, we'll be on 19.2, release upgrade version. Here's another way to look at that. So here we are, production again, that started in January of 2018. In April, we're already at 18.2, July 18.3, and so forth and so on. Here we're in April, next month, we'll be on 19.2 for our uh, release upgrade. But also notice that we have the concept of a release, uh, what do we call that guy again? Release update revision. Sorry, I have to keep thinking about that a little bit. Release update revision, which is kind of like, you know, just an extra little level of confusion. Um, but here, take a look at, by July of this year, we might be technically on 18.5.2 for the release update revisions. And as our notes say here, you know, in the next few years, you might be somewhere between 18.12, 19.5, and 20.1. It's nothing to be intimidated about. It's just knowing that um, we're getting away from the older terminology and it gives us an idea of exactly how stable, or I should say which stable release we're actually running on. In terms of where things are going, I did want to also highlight, take a look at this. 19C, notice how they got it labeled? 12.2.0.3 and 18C's label is 12.202. Yeah. That's essentially what's going on here. And remember, 19C will be the terminal release of Oracle 12. Then we're moving to Oracle 20, Oracle 20C. And we really won't be using that terminology going forward, as I understand it, with 20C. We won't be talking about the old version because 12 is done as of 19C. Here's another little bit of a discussion point here uh, so you can get an idea of when things are going to start getting old. And the dark red, not the bright red, but the dark red uh, ones, I really should have flipped colors here. There was really ought to be in bright red because those are the ones where extended support may cost you significant dollars because it is paid extended support. So you might as well get in the habit of moving to the next RU, the next RUR as time progresses, right? So essentially, uh, RUs are like bundle patches. That's really what it comes down to. And then RURs were sort of like, sort of like the PSUs, but essentially an RUR is uh, a bunch of revisions and fixes extremely well tested against an RU. That's the easiest way to think about it. So, whether I'm going to upgrade to 12CR2 or 18C or 19C, how should I think about it? Well, here's the good news. If you're on 11203 or 11204, 
or even certainly 12.1, and you want to get the 12.2, which again is, you know, the minimum version that I would recommend people concentrate on, it's not that big of a deal. It's a one uh, upgrade release. If you're on 11.2 or 11.201, I should say, 11.202 and so forth here on the intermediate upgrade paths, uh, you're still going to have to do a hop over to 11.204 and then to 12.2. If you're on 9.208, you're going to have to go to 11.203 or 2.04 to get the 12.2. But wait, what if you're on, I don't know anyone personally, I do have some customers uh, who have DBAs that remember 7.3.3. In other words, folks, if you're that far behind, if you're still on 9.207 or you've got apps that are running on 8.17 and they're out there for whatever reason, you have a lot of work to do because you're going to have to do a multi-hop. I mean, that's just really scary. 817 to 9208 to 11203 or higher, then to 122. Um, hopefully, none of us are really in this boat on this call. But again, I'm, the upgrade paths get more and more convoluted. So some of the things to think about. Understand all of these concepts. Number one, realize that we have the concept of a guaranteed restore point. Those things are really great for essentially locking a database, if you will, from uh, losing the necessary redo and archive redo log entries, right, using flashback logging, so that you can essentially roll back a change on your database. So get comfortable with the concept of GRPs. Also, make sure you've got enough data so that you can capture uh, in your AWRs, historical data for comparisons. So when your users start going, as I like to joke, uh, it's running slow, you can say, you know what? No, that query's always run as slow as it has. Make sure you backed up your database statistics just in case an older SQL plan might need to be restored. Um, one of the few uh, topics that people, DBAs, really don't know a lot about is something called real application testing or RAT, great product terrible acronym. But if you don't know much about real application testing, you're really missing out on the ability to test your current workloads, okay, your current workloads with real data instead of, say, running, uh, gee, I wonder how TPCE is going to work on our new database. I mean, if you had the opportunity to essentially take production and play it back in your testing environment, especially if you're coming from, say, uh, something like 11.1 or 11.2, and you want to be sure that when you go to 18C or 19C, things are going to work better or at least as good. Real application testing is something that's extremely valuable. By the way, I wrote several chapters in a book about that about two years ago, so search me out after this if you want to get more data on this. And if you're moving rack, many of us still use rack, and that's fantastic, right? Um, if you're going to be moving from like 9i rack to 12c rack, I remember taking my first 9i rack class because I was getting ready to teach 10g rack. Rack back then was non-trivial. I mean, there were so many things you had to do differently to keep things stable. I think I remember we spent most of our uh, class keeping 9i rack up and running. Not so the case for 12c, right? And, and later versions. Uh, but you're going to have to think about the uh, grid infrastructure stack first and upgrade that first, right? Because that's a major change that came about in 11G. Um, and also be aware that some of the networking capabilities that you had uh, in, say, 9i or 10G, you know, the newer net connectivity uh, things, I don't know if you've looked much at things like uh, uh, Transaction Guard or uh, some of the other features that are available, you know, the older clients that your applications are connecting to may not necessarily work with all this. In other words, folks, there's a ton of things that you need to think about when you're migrating. Here's the good news. There's a ton of Moz notes, my Oracle support notes, to help you go this way. Note there's two different ones for 18C, one for non-CDB, and one for multi-tenant. Most people that ask me, should I go to multi-tenant, I will be honest with you, I will say, yeah, you should certainly consider it strongly. Remember, as long as you have one PDB, 
running inside a single CDB, you're okay. You don't have any other licensing concerns, right? It always cracks me up DBAs being worried about licensing because after all, we don't have control of the checkbook. But we have to be considered about our licensing costs, right? Uh, and the reason we don't get control of the checkbook if we're a DBA is because we would spend the company out of every single dollar. We'd get the best hardware so that we could sleep at nights, right? Uh, we'd be running on, you know, a full rack of Exadata, even though we could probably run on an ODA. So yeah, maybe that's why we don't get control of the checkbook. Um, there's also a really nice doc, 2418.576.1. I just took a look at it this morning on uh, Moz for a complete checklist, right? I gave you some high level just before this, but a complete checklist that's there as well as Aura Check, health checks for the entire Oracle stack. And if you're on Exadata, lucky you, um, you also have ExaCheck, but don't forget that ExaCheck also incorporates many of the features of Aura Check inside. So the good news is if you're going to be making these types of upgrade decisions, you've got plenty of documentation on doing that. Now, one of the best pieces of advice that Charles and I do give, and many of my colleagues at Viscosity give as well, is you really need to think that you should be doing a zero downtime upgrade and or migration and minimize that risk as much as possible. And one of the best tools for this, you thought I was going to say Golden Gate, is one of the tools that Viscosity is very heavily invested in. We're a key partner of Quest. By the way, we have uh, an expert on Shareplex on the call with us. So if you have any Shareplex questions specific to uh, your environment towards the end of this, we'll definitely open that up. And I will introduce my colleague, Arun who will be able to answer any of those questions. If this looks a little bit to you like Golden Gate, well, that's because Golden Gate, though robust, isn't quite the same as Shareplex. The concepts, however, of taking data from an active production system and moving it reliably without any data loss across a network over to another system are essentially the same. The difference is, Shareplex gives us a lot of flexibility that, well, don't get me wrong, I love Golden Gate, I think it's a great product. Shareplex gives us some additional robustness, and in this scenario, we're talking about going from AIX all the way from that top left-hand corner up to Linux in the top right-hand corner. Shareplex can do this with zero or, worst case scenario, less than five minutes of downtime with a database outage in rare cases, all right? Again, we are one of the leading vendors that support Shareplex. If Charles were here on the call, he'd be able to tell you story after story of how valuable this series of techniques are for migrating, especially coming from a big Endian to a little Endian environment, uh, perhaps maybe going from AIX over to Exadata or even ODA. Remember, you're crossing an Endian boundary when you're doing that. The beautiful thing about Shareplex is that it has the ability to do reverse replication from the target back to the source. So in the unconscionable situation where something would go extremely wrong during a migration or upgrade, you have a way to essentially fall back much more gracefully than if you did a homegrown strategy. I'm not gonna beat this to death. That's why my colleague Arun is on the, is on the uh, uh, conference call with us. And if you have Shareplex questions, we'd love to answer them later in this call. But since we're heading towards the bottom of the hour and your time is valuable, I wanna move on to talking about 18C. Why should you take a look at 18C? Why not go directly to 19C? Why not just stop at 12.2? Well, again, remember, 18C, for, for starters, is 12.2.0.2. So you're already at 12.2 when you're upgrading to 12, uh, or I should say, to 18C. I'm going to run through just a few of the key features of 18C. And as our slide notes here, really, this is 19C as well, right? Uh, one of the things that's interesting is I do a lot of work with the autonomous database, um, benchmarking and things like that. In fact, I'm starting a new project later this week with ATP. Um, 
when you really look at those things, remember ATP is not a database, neither is ADW, it's a service. And it incorporates pieces of 12C, R2, 18C, and 19C, right? So uh, again, when we talk about moving to 18C for autonomous, that's a totally different topic. Here we're talking specifically, what's new in 18C and forward? Well, one of the really cool things is now with grid infrastructure, SGI, right? we have the ability to never impact a database with zero impact patching. Um, much simpler to build a new GI home, stop the old GI home, and switch over to the new GI home without affecting any workloads running on the RDBMS. One slide is simply not enough to do this justice. Uh, in the slide deck that I have, actually that I'll be sending out later, we have several other slides on this, but this is one of the newer features in 18C. We've been waiting for this for a long time. Are there other features? Yeah, one in the middle here I wanna talk about is rolling patches for OJVM, right? That's been one of the challenges that we've had for a long time. Finally, that one's been resolved. But if you haven't seen database in memory or DDIM or IMCS, and you haven't seen the power of that tool, you have some really excellent opportunities to speed queries. The cool thing in 18C is now automatic in memory, or DDIM, I should say, is now automatic. Instead of you, the DDA, in concert with your lead developers, figuring out which tables should be left inside IMCS, we're not gonna let the database do it. It's based on heat maps, right? And essentially based on also information lifecycle management policies uh, that are automatically implemented. There's some other cool stuff we're going to talk about, too, in terms of PDBs, like uh, per PDB key storage. There's several enhancements here on uh, schema creation. One of the coolest ones is passwordless schema creation. Remember, if you've taken uh, any of the classes I used to teach, right, like admin one for uh, uh, 18C, one of the things we always told people is, you know, have your, your database tables in a separate schema from the uh, uh, logins that are actually accessing that and make sure you protect that schema's password very carefully. Now with the onset of passwordless schemas, in other words, there is no password, it's all handled internally with encryption inside the database and the fact that there's no more default passwords, the odds of someone stealing from a schema are much less possible. I mentioned database and memory. One of the cool things, in fact, I'm gonna be doing a presentation to collaborate here in a few more weeks is in memory external tables. We can now have a table of organization external and load up the data from a flat file, some type of delimited file into database in memory. And by the way, that's been extended depending on which release you're on, 12CR2, 18C, or 19C, for different levels of not only HDFS, but also for Hive link files. Another beautiful thing, Active, in, Active Directory integration is finally a reality. I mentioned already in-memory support for external tables. Something else that's new in 18C, private temporary tables, which is a, a current flavor of temporary tables, something we've always really would like to have, essentially like a scratch table to do work temporarily, but with none of the defects, or I should say defects, but disadvantages of global temporary tables. Something else that's brand new uh, in 18C and also in 19C, of course, is the concept of fleet management. The ability to have one CDB essentially become the lead PD, or I should say a PDB, uh, become the lead PDB in a fleet of CDBs. This feature uh, has been made available in 18C, but it's gonna be fleshed out even deeper in 19. How do I know this? Because I'm working with beta testing and I'm looking at this feature uh, much more extensively. This is going to make the concept of managing many as one much simpler. Here are the two basic set of steps for doing that. I just started experimenting with this, but this looks like quite the significant enhancement for being able to manage CDBs and the PDBs within them. Oh, one of the really neat features. Uh, this is available actually in 12.2, multi-instance redo apply. What's changed in 18C is that we can now leverage 
blockchain tracking, which has been around forever. It's been around since, I, if I remember correctly, either late, eight, late 10G or early 11G. We can now take our men blockchain tracking files and enable them on active data guard standby databases, physical standby databases, and pair that up with something that a lot of DBAs don't even know about, multi-instance redo apply. So if you're running, for example, uh, a multi-instance uh, rack environment on um, active data guard, you now have extremely fast, extremely fast application of changed blocks, as well as extremely fast, blindingly fast, application of redo. So again, the uh, gap times between capturing changes on a primary and getting it down to a physical standby uh, in 18C become a lot less of a challenge. In terms of security, starting in 18C, we're going to be able to encrypt sensitive credential data that's stored inside the data dictionary. But everything else above that bottom line is actually part of 12C, 12C release 2. You now have the ability, you may not have been aware of this, that system, sysox, and undo can be encrypted. Yeah, that is really crucial stuff. Um, also, it is possible to do encryption of a table space in an offline mode. In other words, you, you can still do it online, but there are some disadvantages there. You have to go ahead and take the table space offline to be able to do it. But now you can essentially do it online. What essentially Oracle does is it builds a new table space with a new data file. And then at the, as soon as that's all encrypted, it essentially switches them, if you will, inside the registry of the database, if you think about it that way. Another thing that is a compelling case for getting over to 12CR2 and forward is the ability to have table names and column names over 128 bytes. Remember, we used to be limited to, I think it was 32, 30 or 32. Uh, no matter, anything over 32 would be nice, right? Uh, in a lot of cases, don't forget, if you're migrating, say, SQL Server or Informix or DB2, uh, other databases didn't have this limit. So now starting in 12201, and I think enhanced a little bit more, if I remember correctly, in 18C, is the ability to have longer table and column names. And that's not trivial, especially if you're migrating um, a workload from another database. Now, again, would I ever create a table that's that long in name? I don't know, maybe. Or maybe I'm just simply converting from an older system. Oh, partitioning. So many cool things that are happening in partitioning. Um, one of the things that you can do now is a little more detail on this coming up, if I remember correctly, we can easily convert a non-partition table to a partition table with virtually no downtime. We have the ability to make partitions read only. If you've got data that's ancient and you know goes back to 1986, why not simply make that partition read only? Some other enhancements, multi-column list partitioning, that's something new where we can have two or more columns for list partitioning. We can now split a partition um, with online maintenance and also uh, do that without any disruption to activities going on, right? And one of the other cool things that I've been experimenting with quite a bit as well, partitioned external tables, right? The ability to have either Hive tables or files based in HDFS partitioned. Now again, there's a difference between having data living externally to the database versus internally inside the RDBMS. But imagine if you had a series of flat files that are containing essentially quarterly data and they're sitting out in Hive as tables or they're sitting out as flat files in a Hadoop system. Why would that ever be there? Well, probably because they've been staged so that other tools Tableau, whatever it might be, are accessing them for data engineering, or for, or I shouldn't say data engineering, um, for, uh, <laughs> uh, for uh, yeah, I guess data engineering would be a data science. There we go, data science. What's really cool is what if you've got a bunch of data inside your existing Oracle database? Maybe you just merged two companies together. They're over in Tableau land, you're over here in, in you know, keeping everything internally to the Oracle database. It's kind of like that old joke on Saturday Night Live, you know, 
Remember that one? It was uh, new finish is a floor wax. No, new finish is a dessert topping. Relax, you two. You can have both. And that's one of the things that's really cool. Uh, with uh, 12 CR2, there were some enhancements to this. And uh, now in 18C, we're going to also have what are called partitioned external tables. And the ability to read HDFS and hide data is going to get uh, another boost coming up in 19C, which I'll mention in just a couple minutes. Um, also, we have the ability to do automatic list partitioning now, it's starting in 18C. We have deferred segment creation that, uh, again, we got that actually in 12C, but now it's been uh, built uh, for also automatic list partitions and interval subpartitions, which saves space. Uh, in other words, only until I really need to create that partition does the actual create of the segment that underlies that partition actually happen. One other cool thing is you can create a table so that it's labeled as for exchange with. Remember, this is one of the things that you have the ability to do is roll off and roll on of uh, tables, right? Basically roll a partition off and make it into a table and vice versa. So now we can create it with that so that it will exactly match the partition table's definition so there's no mystery when it's time to do this. I mentioned this already. Partition external tables uh, in 18C, the key point I want to bring out here is that these are now going to be allowed to be in memory. And I don't have an example of it here, but you can also now create an external table declaration in line. So actually inside your select statement, you can essentially declaratively build an external table. Now that won't work for uh, necessarily for partitioning of an external table, but be aware that you can actually do inline declaration. Where is this going, by the way? One of the things that's really cool coming in 19C, uh, and if you're a member of the beta program, you probably have heard a little bit about this, but let me kind of draw a bigger picture for you on partitioning. One of the things that looks like it's going to happen is one day in the near future, you'll have a partition table some of the partitions will be living inside the database. Some of them will be living as flat files, comma separated value files maybe, or some other delimited file inside a file system that your database can get to, maybe up in the cloud, right, in external storage, and another that are sitting over, or a group of files that are sitting over in a Hadoop cluster. It's the concept of a hybrid partitioned external table. So again, the argument about where should it live? Is this a dessert topping or a floor wax? That all goes away. Because now, in the future, 19, maybe a little later than that, we're going to have this ability to have one file descriptor, one table descriptor, I'm sorry, that says, here's where all my data is, and it lives over here, and over here, and over here, in completely different environments. A lot of the things that, by the way, enable the things that we're able to do with partitioning, uh, we got the ability in 12CR1, I think 12102, the ability to move a table online. But now, through 18C, essentially, all the things that I'm showing you here, moving a table online, moving a partition online, a subpartition online, and all of the other things uh, in 18C, things like splitting, exchanging, uh, combining partitions, adding new partitions, all can be done online. So activities that used to require taking part of my table uh, or maybe even a table space into read-only mode, that's gone. And keeping the indexes updated as we're doing these moves, as you can see here on the far extreme right, that update index clause, make sure that indexes remain usable. I, I don't know about you, but the, one of the things I absolutely hate as a DBA is when a user comes up to me and says, it's running slow, and it's because some index that was there hasn't yet completed being recreated. I'd like to have that all done at the time when I migrate, I shouldn't say migrate, but merge or split or add or uh, exchange partitions. Talk a little bit about DataGuard here as we're getting towards 1245. As you can see, all the way through 12.1, boy, I, I used DataGuard back when it was just called Physical standby. I remember that in 8i. Wow, 81723. Let me tell you, not exactly the most advanced product in the world, but it's amazing where we are now with DataGuard. And 
uh, a couple of things that came out in 12.1, uh, which are pretty impressive. Um, we don't need to use the current log file for real-time apply, right? That, that was actually pretty revolutionary. Um, sequences can be used in Active Data Guard. That was pretty revolutionary too. These are all things that, you know, 12.1 actually really upgraded uh, Data Guard significantly. But here's a few new things in 18C. Did you know you can now create a standby database with DBCA? Yeah, you've got to use the command line interface. You can't use the old clunky uh, DBCA, uh, I shouldn't say clunky, but uh, a little antiquated uh, GUI, uh, because you know, really underneath the covers, the GUI simply calling DBCA in, in uh, uh, a command line mode. I don't know if you realize that as of I think what late uh, 11G, uh, or I'm sorry, actually late 12.1, that's really what was going on. But now you can use DBCA to create the data guard environment, right? Uh, by the way, one of the things that I really love about this new feature is no more all that crazy TNS names that or entries that you had to get just right because now you can use Easy Connect and 18C. Sweet new feature. Here's an example of basically how that looks and here's the thing I'd like to highlight folks right there. Whoops, go back one. There's my primary DB connection string. There it is. Oh. If you've experienced the pain of trying to get a, a data guard instance up and running in either 11GR2 or 12CR1, no worries going forward. This makes things a lot simpler. Also, I mentioned a little earlier about multi-instance redo apply. Now we also have the ability, starting in 18C, with the concept of not needing to have logging enforced on all objects inside the primary database, right? So here's what's interesting. We get two new new logging, I'm mean, going two new no logging modes. Sounds easy to say, right? Standby logging for load performance or standby no logging for data availability. Slightly different, but again, we're trying to either uh, have non-log blocks, so again, you could have a table or an index, indexes might even be more common, that uh, are marked for no logging, and at managed standby recovery, the database goes out and goes, oh, all right, no problem, I will take care of that for you. And again, with minimum redo generation necessary. Um, also with standby uh, no logging for data availability, uh, in that case, standbys that have data when the primary load commits never really have any non-log blocks to worry about. So again, uh, the idea here is that if I'm loading large amounts of data, a lot of times we get an advantage of taking an object as a no-logging mode, right? Uh, we can do direct path loads that way. Uh, obviously, that will go much faster. Um, maybe we forget to... Uh, switch back to logging mode. It could happen. Here it doesn't matter anymore. Now with the two different new standby no logging modes. Don't know if you knew about this, but starting in 12CR2, you now have the ability to have in-memory tables, as long as you're using Active Data Guard, being configured on your physical standby. You have to be using Active Data Guard to do it, but once you uh, are at 12CR2 or above, you now have the ability to use your Active Data Guard instance and get the advantages of 12CR2 uh, in memory, I'm sorry, not in memory uh, column stored, but database in memory features, especially valuable for queries running on the Data Guard environment running on your physical standby. And again, especially if you're trying to leverage data guard for offloading reports. This is another compelling case to at least get the 12 CR2, if not higher. Also, another cool thing. We're gonna talk a little bit more about PDBs here in a minute, but starting in 12.2 and going forward, of course, you now have the ability to have, not like it was in earlier releases, either all PDBs being data guarded or none. Now you have the ability to easily list, and of my five PDBs in this CDB, I'd like these three 
only to have data guard enabled. That's a major change, a major enhancement. We've been waiting for this one for a long time. And again, you've got some neat ways that you can actually specify that. Speaking of PDBs, let's talk a little bit about some of the really neat things that are coming. 12CR2, remember we had 12CR1, was when really multi-tenant multi came out. To be honest, it was a little primitive in 12101. But as time's gone on, from 12CR1 to 12102 to 12201, and now to 18C and 19C, significant upgrades. I'm not going to have time to get into all of these, but I want to focus on several of them that you may not know about very much. Here's a quick uh, screenshot of what you can now do in 12.2. And there's some other features in 18C that we'll talk about as well. 19C is so new, um, there really isn't any point in getting into it, but we'll focus on 18C features. So let's take a look at some of the newer features. Hot clones, the ability to quickly online clone a PDB. The source database, the source PDB, stays open in read-write mode. Starting in 12.2 and forward, all, hot, all clones are hot clones. We'll talk a little bit about this too here, refreshable PDBs. The idea here is kind of like, uh, as, as uh, our slide indicates, poor man's ADG, right? You can essentially create another PDB that accepts information from its parent PDB and will refresh it either manually or automatically on a periodic basis every N minutes. Right? So essentially think of it as a read-only copy of a production PDB. So a read-only refreshable PDB is something that's relatively new. Here's how hot cloning actually works. So I've got three databases sitting in my on-premises environment, pricing, retail, and CRM. And maybe I'm using the Oracle Cloud to uh, facilitate expansion of my environment. Right? So I can quickly make a hot clone of CRM over into my cloud environment. I can also do, if I wanted to, a PDB refresh. Now, at this point, the clone version is no longer in sync, but with a PDB refresh, I can periodically transfer over all changes to that CRM database, right, which is now a read-only version sitting out in the Oracle cloud. Maybe that a uh, particular uh, environment in the cloud is much more robust. Whoops, is much more robust and can handle a lot more users uh, than my CRM instance here in on premises. So again, that's another really neat thing: the ability to do the PDB refreshes. I can also do a PDB relocate. This is significantly an improvement. This came out in 12201, and I know that because I was involved in the beta testing of it, and I broke it. Now, they eventually did get it fixed, and it's working fine in 12.201 and, of course, in 18C. But the idea here of PDB relocate is, here's the same environment, right? I've got my CRM database sitting on on-premises. I can say, move it to the Oracle Cloud once all the files have been copied successfully over to, in this case, the Oracle Cloud. As soon as I finally say, complete the relocate process and bring that CRM database online, Oracle automatically says, take any other changes, commit them at the on-premises database, bring them into the CRM sitting on the Oracle Cloud, and relocate all of my users automatically, their network connections to the CRM instance, the CRM PDB, I should say, inside the Oracle Cloud. It happens automatically, folks. We don't have to do anything for that. So it's not really relocating the PDB as much as relocating the user workload. Pretty impressive little tool. By the way, don't forget to alter uh, pluggable database CRM open, read, write. Uh, otherwise, you'll get some really interesting <laughs> aspects of that. Since we're getting down towards the, our, our final few minutes here, uh, I did want to just uh, buzz through some of these again. Refreshable PDB, we talked about this one already. Um, we now have the ability in 18C to do a PDB switchover. So now we're talking about a refreshable clone PDB and its primary, we can essentially switch over to 
the refreshable PDB. That's what the switch over command literally does. So imagine, we talked about right, uh, a uh, refreshable clone PDB as being poor man's active data guard, starting at 18C, it actually looks a lot more like a uh, data guard or active data guard environment where we've essentially simply switched roles from primary to standby and standby the primary. That's the easiest way to think about that. Complex topic, I don't have enough time to really get into it. Um, talked a little bit about PDB restore points. I'm not going to spend extra time on this, but there are four different types. Uh, the biggest advantage that I see in multi-tenant are all these different things. We now have, starting in 12.2, the ability to flash back an individual PDB. We can have separate PDB character sets. We have AWR at the PDB level. We can have up to 4,000 PDBs per CDB. It used to only be 252. Um, and one other key feature, a couple key features that I want to spend time on, um, memory and I.O. resource uh, prioritization and lockdown profiles. I have several slides at the very end of this presentation that will ship over to you on 19C. Um, I'm going to leave that as sort of I don't want to say homework, but since we're running low on time, I want to make sure I get some questions out of the way. I do want to highlight this one, and I think I'm going to stop and talk to you a little bit more about uh, your questions. So one of the key things in 12.2 and forward, again, 18C is 12.202, 19C is 12.203, is to understand that for the first time in history, we've got the ability to manage memory, I.O. and instance caging or CPU counts at a per PDB level. We can manage PGA and SGA size per PDB. We can manage I.O., physical I.O., between PDBs with max IOPS and max megabytes per second, right? Max IOPS is obviously aimed at the number of transactions per second. Max megabytes per second is uh, based on um, throughput. And now in 12.2, we have the ability to say, no, 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 no. This PDB only gets a share of so many CPUs or a specific number of CPUs. I'm not going to have time to go into this, but I do want to mention to you one of the things to take a look at if you're really concerned about locking people down from doing things inside, say, a development copy of production do take a look at lockdown profiles. Uh, I become quite ex expert at these because guess what Oracle uses underneath the covers for data warehouse, autonomous data warehouse, and also autonomous transaction processing, lockdown profiles. In this example here, maybe I've cloned a production database or maybe even a QA database into a development database, and I want to make sure that all my developers or my QA folks can do is play around with the PL SQL code and look for any issues, being able to debug it, or look through any of the warnings that could be generated. Now I can do that with lockdown profiles. This topic is quite ginormous, and unfortunately, we've just about run out of time, and uh, I'm going to stop right here and go all the way to the very, whoops, go all the way past my last slide. I apologize for that. And leave up our contact information. If you do have any questions, please feel free to contact uh, us directly at Viscosity, right, uh, with uh, the note that we uh, mentioned, hello at viscositynna.com. And for right now, I'm going to open up for any questions. I'm sure you have at least a few. Hi, Jim. Kelly, Hi, Kelly. I... Hi. do we have any questions? We do. All the way in the very beginning, you talked a bit about are you, so release updates and the release update sure. revision. We wanted to kind of dive into those partic in particular, what they actually are, and then maybe the difference in are you and are you ours. Okay. And I popped that slide back up. I know we went through that kind of quickly. The best way to think about are you's is they're bundle patches. That's the easiest way to think about it. If, you can, if, you're, if you remember the concept of a bundle patch, which was a highly uh, uh, tested bundle of critical fixes, that's what an RU is. An RUR is essentially, uh, if you will, I don't want to call it a patch, 
but a field tested, heavily field tested, regression tested upgrade to an RU, right? An RU revision that is focused specifically on any security uh, uh, exploits that may have been discovered since the RU was released. Does that make sense? It's really more of a, hey, we found this security issue, we found a bug perhaps that it had a security loophole or a security vulnerability, and we're issuing an RUR to take care of that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I, hope. Um, I actually had a quick question on that. So how many RURs per RU is there typically? Wow. Um, <laughs> You know, off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to that. I could research that a bit for you. Um, you know, typically there would be almost, it would be uh, unsurprising to have at least one per uh, RUR per uh, release. Uh, it would really depend on what security vulnerability might have been found, right? I mean, it depends on uh, new exploits being found all the time. You know, it's kind of one of the reasons that uh, a lot of times you go into MOS and you look up a bug. And it goes, I'm sorry, this is private. And the reason it's private is because it has something to do with a security exploit, right? Having talked to many of the developers at Oracle about that. So uh, again, and, uh, there could be you know, numerous RURs per RU, but we'd hope there would only be one, ideally none. But yeah, <laughs> that, that's the main, the main point right there. Excellent question though. I can do some research on that, let me know. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then we had a couple quick questions that were, we have emailed to us um, that I'll we'll, uh, talk about talk through separately. Um, but okay. and I don't see any SharePlex questions currently. Um, but I wanted to thank you before we end this. Thank you so much, Jim, for going into detail about all those new features. And it's always really interesting to hear you speak. Um, thank so you. and also again, thank you to everyone else who joined the webinar today. Uh, if you have any questions, like Jim and I mentioned before, you can email us at hello at viscosityna.com. As you can tell, we have amazing experts on our team, including Jim, as well as many more. So feel free to throw over any questions you might have. Um, we will send over the slides, plus, like Jim mentioned, many more slides. Um, and I can also send you a link to our upcoming events. So. On behalf of Viscosity, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. See you guys at Collaborate in a couple weeks. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. -bye. Bye.